All right, so are we now in the phase of the Twitch broadcast where we had like five seconds of awkward silence before we started talking? Yeah. And I'm getting an answer. I'm getting an answer from somebody who can't, who isn't on the broadcast. So <laughs> hi everybody. I'm going to pretend none of that happened, and uh, we're starting deniable. a little bit, little bit early. Uh, it's allegedly deniable. And um, thank you for coming, or more likely, thank you for watching this on YouTube in a couple of weeks. Uh, my name is Shane Ivy, and I'm with Adam Scott Glancy and John Scott Tynes, no relation, and Dennis Detwiller, and Kenneth Height, uh, here for an evening with Acel to talk about Delta Green, the role-playing game, and other Delta Green things. Uh, so, thank you for coming. Uh, and uh, where should we start? Like, usually at the Gen Con thing, you know, we're all sweaty from walking around Indianapolis in the middle of summer, and here, if you're you guys are sweaty that's your business entirely because we're all at home <laughs> um so but but we usually start i usually start with about 45 minutes of news you know sort of summarizing what we've been up to and then in the last five or ten minutes let other people talk about things um uh, so uh so i'll do that but i'm gonna try to be succinct about it right so I usually start by making fun of Greg Stolze for 10 minutes, but he's not here. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah I feel but completely the, at sea now. The, uh, the yeah. internet, the internet, the internet restricts us in so many ways. All right. Has anyone uh, seen Greg's hair lately? It's amazing. Oh my yeah. God. Yeah. He's it's been posting on, uh, on Twitter. It's yeah. crazy. It, I, I thought I knew hair. I thought I understood hair. Well, it grew out of Greg Stolze's skull. So right there, <laughs> there that's yeah. a problem. Yeah. That's I mean, the situation. He, he does uh, have I, that like post mask removal Scooby Doo villain kind of yeah, look now. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> he, he's in, look, investigating haunted amusement park futures as we speak. I'm sure. <laughs> All right, I haven't seen it, so please, for the audience, describe what we're. I mean, you're you're getting pretty I, good, but it's, it's like it's like a very na nappy, like two layer gray, super curly, like it's I almost know. like a do do wop curl that kind of. Comes out if you imagine it's sort of a, a sort of a sheep afro is what I think. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. If, yeah, if you if you imagine a bad '80s porn parody of Back to the Future, he has Doc Brown's hair in that. All right, this is this is all horrifying. This I'm is gonna, all uh, absolutely Jimmy, horrifying. I, mean, I don't know about you guys. I'm going to spend the next hour thinking of Greg Stoltze in a bad '80s porn thing of Back to the Future. It's called weaving a I'll picture let the rest with words, Shane. It's called being a writer. Yeah, I, well, we appreciate you. So that would be like back up to the future or something? Uh, something like that. Something like that. Maybe. Let's not go down that rabbit hole. Oh, my God. Yeah. I thought I was having problems with the, you know, with the self-cut COVID hair, you know, over here. Is he no, just you're, doing, his... you're doing fine. You're doing yeah. okay. Oh, you're, 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 you just look like, you know, the, you know, after the razor blades were um, uh, blockaded by the American Navy situation. You're all right. <laughs> So, uh, Delta took Green, a bayonet. The Labyrinth is available now and in hardback and shipping to backers worldwide. And, uh, there, uh, John is showing off one, and the, the green screen effect is going crazy with Pretty it. Awesome. So, it looks suitably creepy. Am I holding and, the book? Uh, yes, I am. Now, now you are. are. <laughs> now you're not. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, and John won the, uh, the Gold Any Award for it last night, Woo! Uh, where Woo! Ken was. Yay! And was uh, was was helping to MC, and so that was that was really cool to watch. Um, so congratulations, John. Way to thank you. I'm really way to, excited. Way to, about that. way to come back in swinging. Um, <laughs> and uh, so yeah, so that was really fun. And we're going to have some questions and talk about the the labyrinth more in depth uh, uh, in, a, in a few minutes. But let me just I'm going to do a rundown really quick of stuff that we have out now that's really new or things that are imminent. Right. So. There is an audible.com edition of Delta Green Need to Know, which just came out in the last couple of days. It's going to be showing up on iTunes and, you know, the other parts of Amazon and, and so on and so forth uh, over the next couple of weeks. And uh, we've gotten some, it's, it's, it's been an interesting experiment. Uh, our friend Aaron Vanek, that we all go way, way back with. Uh, spearheaded this and put it together as producer and recruited the the talent to do the narration and did a did a bang up job with it and we've gotten some some great feedback from 
fans who are visually impaired, who are dyslexic, you know, who have a kind of a, a harder time than the rest of us navigating uh, game books. So even though it's not fiction and it has to be, um, you know, it, it's, I'm sure it's going to be a challenge to kind of navigate section by section when you're listening, but that's why it's broken up into chapters. So uh, anyway, check that out. It's, uh, I think it's, it's going to, I'm really looking forward to seeing as we go along and hearing how people respond to that and, and how useful it is. Um, and, uh, you know, and whether it's going to be worth exploring that side of things later. Um, we have uh, the scenario PX Poker Night, which, which uh, John and Dennis and Scott put together as a, uh, as a sort of uh, quickie one-shot teaser for Delta Green in 1997 or 98 or some nonsense. Uh, we've got a new edition of that that, uh, that I went through and uh, revised and tweaked and edited and updated to the new game and Dennis did a bunch of art for it. So that's uh, at the printer right now getting reviewed and proofed. Um, and then we'll have that available should be available in August, depending on how quickly they do things. And then we have another scenario, Jack Frost, which is a uh, front to back redo of a scenario that I wrote in 1999. Um, and uh, I had a lot of fun writing it in 1999. And then we, and I was thinking, hey, it'd be cool to revisit that when as a stretch goal for the big Kickstarter. And then I started revisiting it and realized that 1999 Shane was just a shit writer, you know? And, um, <laughs> so I hate that guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm, I mean, you know, I don't like talking bad about the talent, but Jesus. Well, I'm glad he left the industry. I mean, that was, that was really the best for <laughs> It's probably not going to catch, you know, uh, uh, you know, get it, pay any attention to this. But uh, so, so that's gotten a ton of work um, and it is worlds, worlds better. So I'm, I'm actually, I've gotten to the point now, you know, a, a project like this, you sort of start with eh, maybe, and then you kind of go, oh, I hate this fucking thing. And then you go back up to, hey, I'm excited about this. I like the way it's coming out. So we're there now. So that that well, should be that should be out in September. Never throw anything away, Shane. I mean, uh, <laughs> right. no matter how bad it was in 1998, you can yeah. fix it later. I mean, right. um, and you may need words to throw at something someday. Uh, the scenario that I threw into uh, uh, the, the the fiction I threw into extraordinary renditions began as an absolutely piece of shit story. Mm -hmm. It's just that, you know, I refuse to give up on it. And, you know, again, 15, 20 years later, it could be hammered into a, a useful shape. And, you know, uh, yeah, I, I absolutely applaud your 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 bringing something out of the dusty old chest and think, you know, all I can I, I can just I can That's fix right. this. I can fix this. I'm not throwing you away. Yeah. And uh, uh, and then we have a, a revised edition of. Caleb Stokes, Lover in the Ice, which is one of the first scenarios that we published for the Delta Green, the role-playing game um, in PDF. It's never come out in print and we haven't, we, it's been sort of um, half official all these years, but uh, Dennis did some, did some great illustrations for it that make it even grosser. And, Serious nightmare <laughs> fuel illustrations. Yeah, like yeah. congratulate Caleb on right. giving me fucking nightmares. Right. And really uh, so that we should, we sh uh, I expect to have 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 that out in September or October. Uh, all of that coming into uh, 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 PX Poker Night and Lover on the Ice are both going to go into, along with several other scenarios, Black Sites, which is a collection for which we should have the PDF out in October ish, and then the hardback a few months later. We've got Iconoclast by Adam Scott Glancy uh, that's going to be coming out in October, which is. Uh, gone through, um, gone through a uh, rigorous—I I don't want to say tortuous—play uh, testing process. But I, I read, I read a few of the of the play test notes, but not all of them, and they ranged from "Man, this is great, I love this" to something less than that, if I remember right, Scott. I believe my favorite one was uh, favorite play test was. This scenario is unplayable, so I wrote my own. Here's how it <laughs> turned out. And I, I, I have to admit that one stopped me cold. There were some, <laughs> there were some brutal assessments. This glancy guy can't write. I don't know why. Uh -huh. I mean, literally, I don't know why you hire him. Um, <laughs> which, you know. If, if well, I were a less lazy editor, I would have reviewed those and taken some of that shit out. But 
but <laughs> here, I, I can but here we are I why, why aren't we using that guy's version that sounds great <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, I absolutely I mean, understand if you've got guy. a playable version why wouldn't you release that i mean, yeah, shame. I mean <laughs> <clears throat> but i understand the guy who says it's a sh- i'm a shit writer that's fine he had all these examples of why i was a shit writer <laughs> but the guy who went I'm not even going to discuss how he's a shit writer. I'm just going to show you my better product. That uh-huh. one actually, that one actually stopped me cold. That that's just that, weird. I mean, I mean, we can do that to Scott, but you guys can't. That's yeah. Mean. That's how yeah. we, that's how we all got our start, right? It's like, uh-huh. wow, you really suck at this. Let me write something else. And you were hired right on the. Well, spot. it's all yeah. in how you pitch it. You don't say right. that you suck at this out loud. You just send an adventure. <laughs> To uh, to John, you know, saying, "Hey, I wrote this thing. Would it be okay <laughs> if I put it in Pyramid or something?" And you don't lead with John. You suck. Here, look at this thing I wrote. Yeah, that's not how you get a job. <laughs> yeah. Well, the good thing was that in '99, Shane Ivy was a shit writer. So. That's true. <laughs> yeah. And John was feeling really generous, and I have a feeling you were already kind of on the way out the door. But even Probably. with that, yeah. point, so that was that was right around when you taught yourself Excel. <laughs> it's like wow holy shit okay ken ken and that was brutal that was probably <laughs> we keep that we don't joke about that in public ken that was a yeah. good story though sure. i love that story <laughs> all right is that one that we can share with people now that I, you, yeah, now that sure. you've put chekhov's gun on the table or do yeah. we return to it at the end of the podcast yeah i, I want to yeah, hear ken's great. version of it though all right well i mean i'll, I'll tell it it's it's um it redounds only to John's credit, quite frankly. Uh, and I, and again, I think it was at 99, and I think it was it was maybe at Gen Con, or it might have been when I was up in Seattle uh, in my brief window of Watsy time. And, uh, and John and I were talking, and he says, I just taught myself to use Excel. I go, oh, that's great, John, another <laughs> useful skill instead of writing. That's helpful. And he said, um, so what I did was I uh, plotted out uh, Pelgrin, uh, no, not Pelgrin, Pagan Publishing's future uh, using Excel. And I plugged in all of our sales numbers and all of our costs and all of our products. And, and guess and guess what it showed? And I said, I don't know, John. What did it show? And he said, total financial collapse. <laughs> I said, wow, that, you know, Sounds all that right. from Excel. He says, well, I went and, and I said, all right, all right, we can't do that. Um, I'm going to make some assumptions. We're going to, you know, save money on the printing here. We're going to do this over here. And I retooled all of my assumptions and I'm, I felt like a real publisher, you know, making plans and purting things out. And I reran the numbers and, and guess what it showed? I said, I, I don't know, John, what is, total financial collapse. <laughs> and I said, so, so what are you going to do? And he says, well, I think stop. <laughs> I'm going to go do something else. Yeah. I, I think now that I know Excel, who can say <laughs> world's my <Yeah>. oyster. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> this is my ticket out of this two-bit town. That's there's, right. There's RPG Publishing, small press RPG publishing in 1999. People. Yeah, it was. It was. A, it and was how is that different than 2020? Kickstarter is how that's. Oh, Kickstarter, yes. Kickstarter, Kickstarter and Patreon. Oh my God, are you yeah. kidding? If, okay. if you got if if Pagan had Huge. had Kickstarter in uh, in 1999, the world would be very would be different. A very different place. All right. Well, thank you, Ken and John. That was amusing. Um, and uh, back memory lane. I know. I know. All right. Let me let me wrap up my wrap up before before we get to my, my favorite to part of Ken pre- visiting. No, I'm not going to wrap publishing. up my wrap up. John's talking or Scott's talking. Go ahead, Scott. I, just, I was just say my favorite part of Ken visiting was when he came out of the bathroom and said, "Who left their speed loaders in the toilet?" <laughs> and uh, more than one person had to check. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now I'm can't. hoping that's literally actual speed yeah, it wasn't from a revolver. Yes, no, it was yes. a legitimate speed That letter. wasn't some kind of a a Seattle slang thing that I haven't no. heard. No, no, that was that was back when Pagan House was, I believe, in my words, a frat house for serial killers. Yes, indeed. It was very special. It sadly cleaned up a lot since. Then. I know. It's too bad. Just because I left. Things. It's, it's the influence of the women folk, John. It's uh, not yeah. because you left. It's because women moved it's in. It's not an either or. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. So, uh, so iconoclast in October is what I'm ex- what I'm anticipating. Um, and then uh, supplement that outlived ISIS. Uh, it did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's as with many things. It started as a current events and became a period piece. No, I mean, it triumphed over ISIS. Yeah, <laughs> it's what <laughs> defeated ISIS. 
Yes. At the rate we're at the rate we're going, our secret government conspiracy is going to outlive the federal government. So right. I don't I don't see what the problem is. Back when there was a federal government, there was a conspiracy within the federal government to uh... Oh, okay, geez. so uh, uh, then we're going to have probably in PDF in November, uh, Dennis's Impossible Landscapes, Jesus which Christ. is yeah, which is a uh, uh, mammoth Delta Green campaign that kind of uh, grew out of the uh, out of the uh, the fungal roots of John's. Um, lovely work on the King in Yellow back in the earliest days of the unspeakable Oak and Pagan Publishing, uh, and uh, and has kind of spored into a 350, 60 something page uh, campaign that uh, that is is going to be nice once it's published and nice. um, and and uh, you know oh. Dennis. Dennis and Simeon, our designer, and I are all going to like each other a lot better, you know, when we've had a couple of weeks after it's done. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, it's yeah, just a it's, nice it's, it's 160,000 words. To, uh, I think I did 82 illustrations so far, so and I far. need about 25 more. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's about as big as the Handler's Guide. It's it's going to be fun, though. The, uh, uh, the, uh, the way that it's structured, everything kind of, Really, it would it, everything kind of threads together, you know, from from one part of the book to the other. It would it would be it would be way more efficient if we had some way of publishing this book in like a three dimensional format, you know, if it was purely <laughs> a hypertext text product. <laughs> so you could kind of link from you know like going through a you know, the, uh, but we don't we're not we're not that we're not that high tech, um, or we probably could be, but we can't make money off hypertext. So you're just gonna have to pretend. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. But uh, but it's 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 really really cool, and it, um, I'm I'm very much looking forward to not having to work on it anymore. Yeah, me too. Uh, and then in uh, in November also, uh, we are looking at this is not related to Delta Green in the least, except that we did it um, a card game that Dennis and I uh, came up with ages ago, and then uh, recruited. Uh, uh, Rob Haintso to actually do the rules and make them playable, and uh, Kurt Komoda to make the beautiful, beautiful art for it. Uh, and that is WrestleNomicon, which finally comes out in print along with a bonus deck of cards and uh, and a nice, lovely play mat um, that'll all be out and shipping to backers in November. Uh, and it plays very fun and very strategic and and um, and. Uh, and has insanely stupid, goofy puns that the, uh, if I remember right, the first couple of issues of the oath would have been would have been proud to print. Um, and uh, and then beyond that, there's tons and tons going on. But you know, I got to stop somewhere, and uh, those are the <laughs> things that are imminent. So. Uh, yeah, so there we go. Uh, somebody, and I know somebody's already asked about uh, God's Tea, which is Caleb Stokes' campaign for Delta Green. Uh, and that too is coming together in a really, really cool way. It's not as imminent as a release, which is why it wasn't on my, on my, on my bullet point list here. But, um, but he is working hard on that. And uh, the last I, when I talked to him last week and he has... He, he's trying hard to get the first draft wrapped up this month um, because uh, because the uh, state of Missouri is um, is currently planning on sending him and all of its other public educators over the top with the blown whistle to uh, run into the bullets of COVID-19 in a in a couple of weeks. So he's hoping to have his draft done before that. Before I, I, I feel like that. we've named it we've named it COVID nineteen because this is like the like it's like the twelfth battle of in the Azonzo River. We're just gonna <laughs> do the same thing again and again until you know the crowds get thinner. Yeah. Um yeah so that's where so that's where God's teeth is. It's looking really, really cool and um and uh, and really, you know, depressing if you if you take it too too uh, too much to heart, um, which we encourage you to do. So it'll be sort of a nice mix of of scary and morbid and horrifying and heartbreaking all at once. Unlike so on the un, unlike unlike the uh, you know upbeat stuff we usually try to do. Yeah. 
Uh, all right, so there is there's the news. How much how much time did I eat up? Three seventeen. Cool. On that way ahead of schedule. Um, yeah. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go around the uh, around the panel first and let everybody else say things. If you want to give notes on something that I haven't talked about, um, and we'll do it one at a time so we don't do that awkward Zoom thing where I say, "What do you think?" And then we wait for two minutes while everybody figures out who's going to say it. So Scott, you go first. Oh, Tell us uh, something. What do you have in mind? Or if you have nothing in mind, say pass. <laughs> I don't have any uh, uh, comments on on uh, what you're uh, working on right now. And do you want me to comment on anything that's you know still sitting in my queue? Well, we do have we did have somebody, and I knew you would enjoy hearing this, who said, "Hey, can you ask Scott what's happening with horrors of war?" Yeah, uh, but you know, basically, uh, it's a total and complete failure. I oh mean, God! You know that would be my answer. Come on, it's four years late. It's a total and complete failure as a Kickstarter. Um, the, I am still working on it, but uh, I am held up by lack of funds right now, um, as far as getting a lot of it done. Uh, print's going to be a while, but I'm going to have to get paid for. I'm going to have to get paid for iconoclasts before I'm going to have uh, money for this to move forward is how that's going to work. Um, so and, I guess uh, I can tell all of your Kickstarter backers, you know, nice Kickstarter you got there. It'd be a shame, shame if it, anything happened to it. Yeah. Yeah. Right that's, on. that's a good idea, but between, you know, uh, what it's been spent on already and yeah. Uh, being the dumb guy who says, sure, I'll totally give you a refund if you're unhappy with the Kickstarter. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm hung up financially. That right is now. not dumb. That is good customer service and a way to uh, build goodwill into your. I don't think anyone who's gotten a refund has said anything that even vaguely resembled goodwill um, at this point. Um, uh, I think they just remained they remained angry. Uh, yeah. So uh, that's the best thing I can tell you about it. Um, I've got uh, two uh, segments that need to be. Uh, they need to be with someone to do layout, but I can't pay a layout guy right now. I can't get them to, I don't have the money to have them finish it up. But, you know, mm-hmm. again, uh, hopefully, and, I'm, and I've, in the meantime, I've been forced to pick up scut work, doing some of the writing for some other companies. And, uh, you know, uh, that's, again, just to put together the uh, scratch to keep, uh, keep this moving forward in some fashion. Uh, I am well overdue for uh, an update, and perhaps after having been questioned on it in public like this, I will be shamed into giving a proper update. Uh, perhaps the jury's still going to see how you feel about it tomorrow. I, I, or after. I could crawl inside a bottle. You think about this for a while. I, I could crawl inside a bottle and never come out. That is overall less expensive than actually delivering a product. <laughs> um, but uh, I, we'll 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 see how it turns out. Yeah, uh, yeah. I I am not giving up on the project. I just I'm not giving up on the theme of the project. I even, you know, did some play testing. Uh, I've done some play testing this week on a couple of scenarios that aren't going to appear uh, in the, uh, in the book. And, and I uh, was very happy to get a chance to uh, play test some stuff uh, for this, for the book that actually ended up flipping a scenario. There's a scenario called the wounded where everyone plays. Uh, the original idea was, and Ross went through it, where everyone plays wounded soldiers in a British military hospital with its, lovely table of mutilations because you were all in the the non-recovery uh, ward that is to say your injuries are permanent. that sounds awesome i love yeah. the idea of a table of mutilations so uh various characters ended up with i think ross ended up the with the great uh, pixie song yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, i think ross ended up with a, a, a shrapnel permanently embedded in his head lost 1d3 intelligence and you know right off the bat of the scenario but I, I played it through with the uh, with, with, with people playing the the, the uh, uh, soldiers, but then I went back and uh, you know took another run at it uh, because I did a play test where uh, played with a bunch of uh, uh, women gamers and they all played the nurses at the same hospital and the scenario was rather shockingly ran re- shockingly well from either the point of view of the junior staff who will not be believed when they see f- crazy fucked up shit or from the damaged soldiers who also will not be believed when they say they see crazy fucked up shit. So it, it was, I was kind of amazed that it worked out that yeah, way. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Uh, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move over to John. John, hi there. How you doing? I'm great. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Is that it, is uh, that it for John? Oh, no, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm great. Uh, how are you? Um, 
So we're all sorry, good. But, we're all fine. We're all, we're, yeah. we're all fine down here. Yeah. <laughs> it's a boring conversation anyway. All right. Uh, so Labyrinth is uh, shipped to, or it, and is still shipping to Kickstarter backers, which is awesome, uh, and it'll be available uh, all over the place. Um, so the Labyrinth uh, handout kit, uh, I turned in all the text and planning for that a um, month or two ago, and that's underway, I think, with uh, Simeon and company. I'm uh, looking forward to that. There's some really cool handout stuff in there that I'm very happy about, um, uh, which I guess I won't spoil because it does have like all kinds of spoiler things for what's in the book. Mm -hmm. But um, Shane, when do you think that is uh, going to be vaguely heading? Oh, out? probably. You know, I, I hope I hope by December because we've got that we've got all the text in for that, and um, and I'm sort of we're, we're we're churning out a couple of these shorter things at the same time that we've got poor Simeon hip deep in impossible landscapes, yeah. which is going to be an absolute nightmare to, uh, to lay out. So, uh, so I hope that by the, by the time, by the time they finish landscapes, uh, Simeon is still with us, you know, has not decided to <laughs> abandon this, this uh, life for something less depressing and challenging. And, he has, uh, he is considering moving into Dennis's basement. And uh, well, that would, I don't know if that would be an abandoning this life or, or what, but uh, it's a way yeah. station. It's like the Bardo. <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah, so the, so the, so the handout thing, I hope, I, I hope by the, uh, like in probably to November, December, we'll have that out. If I can put okay. that in, in Simeon's hands. And then we also, you know, we'll, we'll want to re review um, if there's work in that, that Dennis ought to do to prep it before it gets laid out, you know, there might be things that could, that should, that deserve proper illustration sure. as well. So, so yeah, so that's kind of where that is. It's, it's landscapes. That's the, that's the big brick in its road. Yeah. Um, and then uh, beyond that on my plate, um, I'm writing a scenario for our labyrinth related scenario anthology, um, which I need to do. And I've been thinking about that. I've made a bunch of notes about it. Um, it's going to be, um, related to thematically, at least the Atlanta child murder case, um, and will likely be set in Atlanta, but in the modern day. Um, and I've been having fun with that. I think it's going to be kind of a shotgun scenario, like, like a one session, you know, go kind of thing, as opposed to a lengthy investigation scenario. Um, right. but I've got some ideas along those lines. I think it'll be really fun. Um, and we'll have a lot of callbacks and echoes to the Atlanta case, uh, from the seventies. So that's kind of my um, my next uh, stuff on the Delta Green docket. Um, yeah, and I imagine that Scenario Anthology is going to be a twenty twenty one release if all goes well. Yeah. So so John, while we have you here, we had somebody uh, we had we had a, uh, one or two people asking uh, that. Uh, well, there's two questions about the labyrinth. So first of all, somebody asked, did you have all eight of those factions planned out at the time of the Kickstarter? Right, or did some of those kind of take shape as you were, as it as it was developing? Yeah, they definitely changed over time. Um, I had a you know a handful of notions when I first pitched the project to Shane and company, um, and by the Kickstarter, I'd already been getting underway with some of that work. Uh, I think I think the Center for the Missing Child had been written by the Kickstarter, for example. Um, but other groups that I had in mind, um, I didn't have the complete list planned out at that point. Um, I had a bunch of ideas some of which i did some of which i didn't um but it was not definitely not all planned out by the kickstarter and then we had a related thing were there any any factions or characters that got cut and if so why yeah there were two um that i i wouldn't say they got i mean i didn't cut them exactly i just decided not to do them which i guess is kind of a cut uh so and actually they're both kind of in there in sort of vestigial ways um one of them is the Wolves of Eric, I think they're called. And I forget if that's the real world group or the fake group I made up that was based on them. Oops. Um, which is <laughs> uh, white supremacist Nordic Aryan worshiping biker gangs, um, which who burn down churches and engage in rituals to Odin and so forth. Um, actual thing, which is freaky as hell. Um, they turn up in a couple places in the book. Uh, specifically, they're in the um, uh, Witness Alliance chapter. Um, they get written up a little bit in there. And I, I was considering writing them up in a bigger way, um, but I didn't mainly because they're ultimately they're just like a, like a Bush League cult um, that's not a super interesting or longer term kind of villain. And the antagonists in the labyrinth, I was really trying to make them, each of them be a structural problem. 
that uh, you can't just like shoot somebody in the head to solve necessarily. Um, and I wanted to make them like a more ongoing antagonists. And uh, the biker gang, they're cool. It's a fun idea. That's why I kind of left them in there as a, as a, as a minor element. Um, but they didn't seem to rise to the level of uh, like like completely screwing over the players that I was really going for in the labyrinth. Um, it the sounds other group... like you would you would want to yeah that 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 would be a challenge right because the lab the whole point of the of the groups that you put together in the labyrinth is they're each kind of nuanced enough that they're thorny right there are no yeah. easy solutions and that means you have to find ways to make them uh, sympathetic in some way right. Yeah, and, and like the and, micro and gang, if like it's white supremacists, you know, fuck those guys. Yeah, and really all you have to do is just like plant some heroin on them and call the cops, and you know, problem solved. So it's not the most exciting uh, villain as a as a result. So they're they're in the book just kind of for fun, and they'd be a great like one off adventure villain, for example, um, which would be great for a single operation. Um, the other group that I um, thought about quite a bit and was kind of into, but ultimately decided that they were just too stupid um, was. Uh, and it's, it's embarrassing even to talk about. It was like, briefly it felt like, like, oh, that's kind of fun. I don't know, that could be cool. And then I was like, no, that's just stupid. Um, is, is this I a was... return to the to the, uh, the the Michael Jackson Disney? Oh, thing God. Shattus? Oh, Jesus. Shane, Why'd you bring that up? I can't even remember that Shane, thing. Like, I know it exists, but I, I wait, probably... Wait, the rest of us remember it. I was probably drunk. Yeah, I get I get emails about it. Do you have a copy? Yes, I do, but no, I don't. Right? <laughs> no, I'm not. Go I am not going to scan it. This is based. That thing is basically uh, Delta Green's, you know, holiday special. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought it was some like round robin thing. We all did like like me and three other designers each did a scenario that was like like connected together in some fashion and sounded like a really great idea at the time. Yeah. yeah. All right, I have uh, my my sort of kind of apologies, John. Go ahead. Yeah, no, that's fine. I did. I just remember an illustration from the Shadis article, the Shadis printing, where there's this <laughs> this or clown something. on a bed passed out, you know, in a drug and do stupor and i don't even know if that was pretty crusty but that's basically what it looks like is crusty the clown wiped out from a heroin bender or something and it's like yeah this is oof. yeah Mistake. it was a strange strange thing mistakes were made yeah that's for sure well, the, the faction of the Labyrinth that I was thinking about, and actually even they are like very vaguely still in the manuscript um, in one place. Um, the idea was like, I was thinking about the serpent folk, the serpent people, um, and uh, you know, ancient sorcerers from the primordial days and so forth. Um, and uh, I had this notion of them being around and being interested in actually causing climate change to restore the kind of greenhouse earth days uh, the Precambrian or whatever it was, so that their kind could like once again flourish and be happy and so forth. And of course, people would die off because it's a horrible Venusian landscape. Um, and the mechanism by which these these folks were going to do this is that they were basically the Koch brothers uh, in, in American <laughs> politics. And so they were serpent like... Serpent Koch brothers. Yeah, they were like Serpent Koch brothers. That's... <laughs> 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 yeah. And... <laughs> And uh, they were, you know, wealthy industrialists, you know, disguised as humans uh, who were spending their money to essentially like defeat any measure that tried to address climate change. And they were investing in like polluting industries that would generate carbon that would hasten climate change. So that was kind of their deal. Um, so, but so, so serpent folk turning point USA. Yes, that's, that's, that's pretty accurate. Yeah. Um, and part of that was they were going to have their you know, uh, gaining support from religious right and, and trying to be trying to weave kind of a, you know, God's okay with this sort of scenario, like, hey, it's God's kingdom, we just live here. And if it's going to turn into a jungle, that must be his plan. Um, so there's a bit Garden in the sowers. Of Eden. Yeah, exactly. There's a bit in the sowers. It's in the book, snakes. Um, where, <laughs> <laughs> uh, where um, one of the entry points for the sowers involves a deacon uh, stealing a... Uh, uh, historical archaeological Jewish artifact of a, sp a specific kind of knife that's part of a traveling exhibition of like biblical artifacts. Um, and that, that was intended to be an, or an exhibition run by these guys. Like that was one of their many sort of front operation things they were doing was to drum up enthusiasm for their vision of this kind of apocalyptic future world. Um, but ultimately I just decided that like that, that's such a broad 
target and uh, kind of a dopey concept. And so um, I decided to not do that. That's what happened there. Gotcha. All right. So uh, let's uh, let us talk to Kenneth Height. He's been waiting very patiently for uh, patiently, for a chance yeah. to uh, for a chance to expound. You got anything um, you want to expound on? Yeah, I, th I think the the immediate thing to expound on is uh, the Borellis uh, connection, which is the fall of Delta Green globe trotting campaign uh, tied, as you might guess from the title, to the heroin trade. Uh, it's set in 1968 when the uh, uh, Federal Bureau of Narcotics is uh, falling apart in scandal and investigation to be replaced by the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, which, of course, is a great entry point for Delta Green to, you know, second a bunch of agents into that new unit and then send them off to investigate mythos things. And it, uh, it's, it's, it's a globetrotter. It goes from uh, Indochina to uh, Marseille and then into America. Uh, it's got a lot of you know stuff that's tied into the historical era. There's a long sequence set during the, the May 68 in, in France, which is great fun and is you know practically a role-playing scenario even without our help. Uh, and it is uh, done, it is written. Gareth uh, Ryder Hanrahan uh, finished it out from my outline. Uh, it is now being cut back to being only one book in size because it was enormous. Uh, Delta Green Adventures, like I need to tell this crowd, turned out to be much longer than other adventures because if you have federal sanction or even federal resources, you have a lot more options than other investigators and other games do. So there has to be a, well, what if they just ask the CIA? Uh, well, I guess I better put that in. Um <laughs> So there's a lot of uh, material that that winds that wound up uh, being shaved out of it. So it is being packed as best we can into one enormous book. I think it wound up being about 180,000, 200,000 words, something like that. Mm -hmm. And it's um, in, I, I wanna say it's in layout now. I think Gar is done with the editing and I think it's in layout. I guess Shane would know better than I do. Where the where the editing? I haven't stands. seen I haven't seen uh, seen layout. Uh, well, proofs yet, like so. I said, I don't think we've started. Uh, we've we finished layout. I, I think it's right. in the process of being laid out or thought about laid out cool. or something. Uh, but that's where it is now, which means potentially and the cat will yell at me, so I'm going to say yeah. potentially end of 2020, maybe or early 2021, depending on. You know what else is in the Pell Grain queue, which again I'm not the expert on. So hey, that's uh, that's where Borellis uh, connection is. I had a, I had a question uh, from a from a fan asking what kind of campaign is Borellis? Is it more? Uh, they say is it a more straightforward structure, a la Eternal Lies, the Zelazny Quartet, or more open ended? You know, like a Dracula dossier. It's it's more of a it's more of a classic, and it's even less modular than uh, Zelazny Quartet, which you can play in any order. This is very much a trail, uh, you know, an Eternal Lies, Shadows of Yog Sothoth, old school uh, globe trotter. So you're literally mm -hmm. following the heroin trail in a sense uh, along all the stops on it, and uh, it turns out something awful is happening at every one of those stops. Can you believe it? And so the uh, what what begins as just um, Delta Green using the heroin trade as an excuse to put you in becomes an ongoing uh, conspiracy that you uncover, uh, possibly right, connected right. to the name Borellis, you can say. And the uh, and so it's, it's like that. But the scenarios themselves can be popped out and played singly if you don't want to commit to an, a whole campaign. For example, in my own Fall of Delta Green campaign, I'm playing Operation Puritan, which is the scenarios set at Radio Liberty in Munich um, uh, in 1968 as they're moving their buildings. So there's the, the sort of the, the, um, the, the redheaded stepchild desks are all alone in the enormous former Nazi airport. Um, uh, and guess what? Bad things are happening. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, uh, the uh, similar related to that question, they're curious, does that deal with more with human adversaries or is it a struggle against a greater threat? Well, I mean, the human adversaries in the world of Delta Green are at the very least attempting to involve greater threats at all times. But uh, most of your adversaries, I will say, are mostly human. I mean, the, the human component is is there. 
Uh, and, and because I think in my mind anyway, that's one of the things that makes a Delta Green scenario is that it's not just calling in artillery on some tentacled monster. It's getting yourself sort of embedded in the disgusting things human beings do and then adding just the one next layer of disgusting that is the Cthulhu mythos. So, I mean, the, the, the heroin trade is is appalling now and it was appalling in 1968. I don't think I'm sharing any new information to people. The United States government's interaction with it was also kind of disgusting, some of which is foregrounded in the game. And some of it, some of the great decisions the American federal government was making in 1968 are, are present all over the place. Did I mention <laughs> that there's two scenarios in Indochina, for example, and <laughs> one at uh, Radio Liberty where we are encouraging the Salafists to help out with anti-communist propaganda because that couldn't possibly hurt us in any way. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, very cool. Uh, the, uh, so what, uh, Ken, what else is going on with you? Anything else you want to, you want to, you want to tell the Delta green people about? Well, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm plugging things, or you, uh, can, or you can ask questions or, you know, in, the, in the world of, of, uh, of, of plugging things and uh, Kickstarters at some point, uh, pandemic willing uh we'll have hellenistica my fifth edition D, &D setting uh, set in the good parts version of the third century bc mm -hmm. uh that will be done and then uh, out i used to say it was going to be summer of 2020 but i said a lot of things were going to happen in the summer of 2020 and look at that none of them did <laughs> uh so we'll see when when that happens in the shorter term i'm doing a an expansion for yellow king role-playing games set in San Francisco, 1912, the sort of one last job for your Paris artists who are summoned back by yellow activity in San Francisco. So you get to meet Jack London and Ambrose Bierce and a good looking kid named Clark Ashton Smith with a head full of poems and a heart full of dreams. Um, so that'll, that'll be fun. Uh, and then uh, I don't know, this is really more of a question for Shane and Dennis, I guess, you know, I've, got a lot of time on my hands to read classic horror fiction and maybe even start <laughs> annotating it so <laughs> yeah that we, could be a we thing love, yeah we say. yeah we we would love to do another annotated book like the annotated king yellow um and you know we've chatted with ken about picking a target and going forward with that i i'd certainly love to do another one um so yeah uh, we should we should convene and chat and plot i agree normally we have people in the audience that I've planted to ask this question and <laughs> these foreign times I have to be my own shill which is just <laughs> undignified quite frankly and I resent right. it <laughs> yeah um, and we had people asking about uh, also about uh, d about Delta Green fiction since we were on the uh, we going on to the subject of fiction which is you know I mean we're about to put together Dennis writes constantly writes these little uh, micro slivers of stories uh so we're gonna we're about to put out another edition of uh, the way it went down which will be a very short um collection of those and um we haven't really put a lot of time into larger fiction projects uh and mainly from my perspective i guess that's mainly just because my hands are already kind of full with every you know with all of the uh rpg projects right so um and the, the fiction books are kind of a sideline right so um so that's something that that again would i would uh it was fun to put together the last one when i mean that was geez what five years ago now uh, mm -hmm. so we ought to do that well point. yeah kick kick starting is the key on that front um as long as we can kickstart the product, you know, the fiction's always there. I think if we said, everybody go write a story, we'd have a pretty passionate oh, yeah, book. Yeah. We, we, no, we, ne we never have trouble recruiting some really good writers to contribute. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. But we've got, with Kickstarter, we've got to be a little bit wary, right? Because you, you, you go to that well too often, um, especially in our case. We've got awards from past Kickstarters still outstanding, you know, so... Once we once we deliver uh, everything from WrestleNomicon, that'll take that one off the plate. We've got the 
the core deliverable from the labyrinth is out, right? So we're just kind of picking up the stretch goals now. And we've got a, a handful of stretch goals still percolating on the big Kickstarter from uh, from 25, end of 2015. So, um, but the next one that we have in mind, uh, I don't know, we haven't really thought about it. I'll, I'll get with Dennis and we'll kind of talk about whether we ought to factor in some new fiction as stretch goals for the next project that we're that we have sure. coming up. But I don't want to cool. get into that too much because. Um, because I'd rather people go away frustrated than excited. Um, and you, know, uh, you really know how to run one of these panels. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, all right, Dennis. What what else is what else is going, what's going on with you? Well, uh, the way it went down, Volume Two, uh, which is a little bit longer than the first one, is done and in change cover and everything. So it's no longer me. That's Shane. Mm -hmm. Everybody say Shane. Um, Impossible Landscapes is with Simeon. I'm working on something called Arc Int, which is archaeological intelligence, which is uh, 20,000 or 25,000 words on um, various artifacts and weirdness for Delta Green. Each one is kind of a, a, a plug and play um, supernatural feature of the week that you can drop into your Delta Green game. It'll give you a lot of fun. I'm um, also working on uh, two scenarios right now featuring the Great Race of Yith for uh, our first uh, threat matrix book called uh, Those Who Come After, which is a, kind of a source book on the Great Race of Yith. Um, and I'm writing uh, two or three dozen little scenarios at the same time, <laughs> slowly going crazy and jumping between them as I get bored with one, I'll jump to the next. Yeah. Um, and doing a lot of utility art for um, various other projects. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's been going great. Uh, that's about it on my front. So so one of the questions that we had from some, from, uh, from, uh, from a fan is, are there any DG novels in the pipeline, which we've kind of already answered, but it says, if not, what modern novels would you recommend? Uh, John, do you have, do you have, does something come to mind for you? Hmm, Things uh, in a modern setting that kind <clears throat> of lend inspiration? Yeah, I don't know that I've read anything lately that really seems <clears throat> super applicable to this. Um, we're actually doing uh, kind of a family book club. So we all are reading books together, which means I'm reading like YA books and middle grade, uh, you know, fantasy fiction and stuff, which is super fun, uh, but not the most uh, Delta Green related content currently. So yeah, um, yeah no, I don't know. I, I would actually suggest on This Is a Moron, God forbid we begin talking about like what TV shows are we watching, um, but uh, Homecoming on Amazon Prime Video, um, mm -hmm. both seasons are uh, both excellent and definitely very DG flavored in certain government conspiracy kind of aspects. Cool. Scott, what about you? Anything come to mind? Well, we've already, you know, a million times we've, we've said declare, you know, um, uh, uh, we, we've covered, I guess, all the real classics. Um, thanks for sending me, uh, was it uh, Ward of the Knife? The, uh, the, the, yeah, I think you're the one who sent me the uh, book on, the transformation of the CIA into a military apparatus at the beginning oh, of the, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, with the, the, what a, we created a hell of a killing machine, I think is the quote <laughs> about how they've trained, they've turned the CIA from an organ that collects intelligence into an organ that kills individuals and the department of defense. Now that they don't get any more intelligence from the CIA had become an organization about collecting intelligence. And this is all, back in 2001, of course, but the, the information that came out of that was uh, extremely good for, you know, sort of giving a, uh, a bureaucratic DG flavor to, to, to uh, what's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 there's, that, that was a, a very good read as far as I'm concerned is uh, about giving, uh, giving that, uh, that flavor of, of Delta Green. Again, you know, <laughs> it's describing events at the beginning of the war on terror you know, um, you know, and that was a while back. So, right. you know, speaking um, of that, we were, I think we were talking earlier about uh, current recent events that seem so current that were actually 20 years ago. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. But um, I guess that's the only thing I can think of at the moment um, that uh, really, I mean, you know, that sort of jumps out at me. Um, uh, I still occasionally pick up a, you know, uh, Charles Strauss novel, uh, you know, but those are uh, incredibly lighthearted, 
uh, by comparison. <laughs> uh, something that I was I was very pleased to have Charles Strauss complain about when he was at um, the H.P. Lovecraft Film Festival. He wants to make he wanted to make those novels dark, and his editors were like, "No, it's got to be funny. Make you know people like to laugh, you know." Um, but occasionally he'll slip in things about how, you know, like he and his wife are having, you know, the characters, the main characters are are having a kid and they keep a shotgun loaded in the house, you know, for that day, you know, and the uh -huh. first to go is the kid and then the wife and then he, <laughs> he's putting the barrel in his mouth, you know, and I'm like, okay, that feels a little more Delta Green, you know, <laughs> when case nightmare green becomes a reality. But for the most part, those are very, very, very light, and, you know. John, did you have uh, something come to mind? Yeah, I did. I just remembered uh, earlier this year, I read uh, Heaven Cracks, Earth Shakes by James Palmer, um, which is a uh, nonfiction book about uh, China in 1976 when um, the death of Mao happened and a massive, uh, horribly devastating earthquake occurred uh, as well. And the it's kind of marking the end of the Cultural Revolution. And if you ever want to see like, you know, read through an example of like, what is a dysfunctional bureaucracy like, you know, where it's all about like covering your ass and covering things up and lying as much as possible to salvage your career. That's super great in that book because it's nothing but, uh, but also the cultural revolution uh, is super awesome. And one of those, like that time shall be easy to know for all men will be laughing and killing like the old ones. Like the cultural revolution is fucking that. Uh, and reading through that and the horror stories of like village after village after village where some random local person decides they're going to begin denouncing their neighbors and their school teacher and so forth. And all the waves of murders and mutilations and tortures that followed all over the place uh, is fascinating um, and ripe fodder for, you can imagine like the effects of like the Loigor or anything else in Delta Green that kind of works along those like mass mm -hmm. hysteria, chaos kind of lines. Uh, mm -hmm. James Palmer's book is uh, an outstanding read and really inspirational for those purposes. Ken, what about you? Any uh, any any book recommendations? I mean, if I'm going to recommend uh, a book that reads like Delta Green, I, I always start uh, with Radiant Dawn and Radiant Dusk by Cody Goodfellow, mm -hmm. which are uh, up to the minute techno thrillers written right before 9/11 changed techno thrillers background story <laughs> forever. They were written, I think, in '99, but they are very very. Delta Green and that they're about, um, uh, you know, evil mythos conspiracies, uh, the main characters uh, suffering from PTSD. It's, it's uh, both realistic and heightened in sort of the ideal Delta Green way. The, the, the sort of the, the sketch of the plot sounds ridiculously manic, almost like a Brian Lumley story, but the actual handling of it is very, very good and very, very grounded and very realistic in a, uh, sort of a, a, a grimy um, uh, uh, spinal sort of way. So I, I think it really threads the Delta Green Needle in a good way. And if you haven't read them, because they were, you know, printed by some sort of fly-by-night operation. With I, the I think, world's worst covers. I yeah, mean, oh yeah. Absolutely, it, covers that would make you just walk away immediately. <laughs> yes, as, as indeed <laughs> they did before I met Cody and then said, well, <laughs> I'm taking the freaking jump now. This is your fault. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And they're, they're really very good. And again, I think that they should be timeless classics. No one should be on this chat who hasn't read them. And I certainly hope mm -hmm. the chat is full of people saying, I don't know why Ken's recommending Radiant Dusk. I read it 10 years ago. But if it's right. not, if you're that one guy who's not saying that, go read Radiant Dusk. I mean, not today. Obviously, you got virtual Gen Con to attend, but, you know, right. next right. week. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And on, on the note of plugging another author, uh, obviously, I have violated my reason for being so I have to scamper away uh, to Ken and Robin talk about stuff live, which is in nine minutes. So bye, everybody. Right. Bye, Ken. Ken thank John, good to see you. Dennis, us. Shane, you. Scott. Every, great to see everybody. Thanks, Twitch. All right. Bye. Bye. I would also, bye-bye. Have fun talking about stuff. I, uh, would, I, I just <laughs> was looking through some of my books to try and see if I could remember something that I'd read recently. And I, I, uh, I got to say that uh, T.E. Grau's I Am the River. Uh, yeah, that was quite good. Uh, it doesn't hold, it, it doesn't, I don't know, feel like I, I'm, it, it's hard to, I don't want to talk about things that maybe didn't quite make it purely Delta Green because I don't want to spoil it, but I would say the mood, uh, it created an atmosphere that's very Delta Green and it's all set down in uh, Southeast Asia and there's a whole thing where, you know, the, 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 this group of soldiers is brought together 
uh, from basic from the stockade. They're essentially guys who are on their way to uh, the LBJ, uh, the Long Bin uh, stockade, the LBJ jail, I think is what they call it, Long Bin jail. Uh, and they're all on their way there, and they're brought out into the jungle. And then, what do you mean we're in Laos? I didn't wait. That is it. Are, are we committing a crime by being here? You know, and it just goes downhill for them from that point forward. You know. So it's got a lot in it that it has a good flavor uh, for Delta Green, and I would I would recommend that one as well. It's very short; it's like more almost a novella, really. Dennis, what do you think? Um, my my big ones for the last uh, five or six years, uh, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, the Southern Reach trilogy by Vandermeer um, is the second book is as close to Delta Green as I've seen in writing. Um, even the person in charge has no real clear idea what's going on and everything is falling apart constantly and there's really no hope in stopping anything. Mm -hmm. um, there's a very clear mood drawn there of uh, government bureaucracy meets immovable, uh, immovable extra dimensional force and cannot deal with it at all. Right. Um, although they pretend to. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then the second big um, it's two books now. Uh, and this is more alt history, future history, uh, but I have to mention Christopher Brown's uh, Tropic of Kansas and Rule of Capture are both exceptional books about a near future America um, where Trump has run the ultimate kind of con and that's all old news now. And uh, the U.S. is divided into kind of bizarre little petty states and people escape to the Toronto suburbs to rob people's houses and live in the wild and then to be deported back over the wall. Um, they're just wonderful books. Rule of Capture is Christopher Brown is a lawyer and he basically wrote the future of American law if the Patriot Act and the rest become kind of enshrined as a portion of American law. Um, and it's a very interesting read. Uh, the second book, Rule of Capture, is all about legal proceedings in this weird, semi-feudal, pseudo-democracy future. Um, Mm. There's a very good feel to it. It's very dark and very, um, very fun reading. Um, so I'd recommend those, those two groups. Um, mostly the Brown stuff is the, the mood of um, uh, bureaucracy being in motion around you that you can't control. Um, and the uh, annihilation stuff is just fantastic front to back. I, I loved all three of those books. Yeah. Unreservedly. Yeah. Um, all right. So we have a question here that uh, uh, he says, I was talking with a fellow Delta Green handler about the history of Delta Green, that uh, uh, the handler's guide mentions Delta Green being disbanded in 45, reformed in 47, and they want to know what was happening in 1946 in that gap year. Scott, stuff. you want to you wanna tackle that? Stuff, stuff and stuff. things, things and stuff. Uh -huh. I think everybody was, was having everybody was having babies. They just took a took so a vacation. We were in Europe. It was a gap year, you know, peace yeah. kind of thing. I mean, if we've learned anything uh, from history, is that absolutely nothing of importance happened between the years, uh, you know, during uh, uh, 1945, 1946. You know, it's a it, it's a dead period. Right. Um, <laughs> well, the answer is is that um, uh, you know uh, I'm imagining it as a time period where. People who were in Delta Green's immediate assumption is, well, they're gonna, they're gonna all call us back to the flag. I mean, this problem didn't go away. I mean, they're gonna give us, they're gonna, they're gonna get on the horn to us any minute and say, you know, Bob, you did great work over there. You know, hashing those Nazis. You know, come on and get in for the now. Now we gotta worry about the Stalin and what he's doing with all his Karatekia scientists. He smuggled back to you know Moscow. And they think that's coming, and then it just doesn't, and then it just doesn't, and it just doesn't, and then uh, they start. You know, ex Delta Green guys are like, "We how how do we get ourselves back into the game?" Um, they you know because the bureaucracy would just pref prefer that this problem didn't exist, so it doesn't. And we've definitely learned that's a thing that governments can do. Uh, so I'm imagining that uh, most of that time period was yes, yeah, sure, there could have been. Uh, you know, things going on where ex Delta Green guys are acting like they do during the 70s and uh, 80s during the cowboy period a little bit. 
But at the same time, they're angling for a way to get back on board. And when the whole Roswell thing happens, they immediately attach themselves to that rising star and, you know, get Delta Green resurrected about the same time that the CIA comes into existence. And we spin off the Air Force and Majestic 12 gets its marching papers. Um, uh, so, so I don't for, like the, uh, the, the, at the upper end of the, you know, the, the, at the level where the le- of the leaders, where they actually know what the heck is, is what, there's mm-hmm. a lot of scheming and angling and then for the guys on the ground right they're just kind of doing their normal thing and waiting because the yeah. orders have stopped coming down you know, this is this is 1947 so you know jager hoover is still the man running you know he's he's a, maybe the zenith of his power as fbi director um and uh, i always sort of had the impression that you know the, the that the fbi really doesn't get into uh delta green nearly so much until uh, the good director is tits up until he's dead. Um, mm-hmm. That he always sort of stood in the way of that, um, uh, mostly out of bureaucratic things. He's not going to, you know, he was always opposed to the OSS. And there's a whole yeah. stupid thing in World War II. Well, and, when the, got, and when and when Delta Green is is mainly a DOD program, right? Yeah. I mean, those guys, those guys. I, I can't imagine they would want uh, any sniff of what they're involved in coming near J. Edgar Hoover. Yeah. I mean, again, he, 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 we actually had FBI agents running around in South America because Hoover somehow managed to convince FDR to, to right. divide that off as his personal spy don't, fight. Don't give it to that shithead Donovan. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And, you know, so I, uh, I'm imagining that, uh, you know, yeah, Delta Green's trying to get itself reorganized. Um, and some of this may have happened. Because, and certainly there was pressure on the OSS to go away. And some of that came from Hoover. You know, yeah. Uh, so, so on a on a related on a kind of a related thing, uh, the, the, uh, we have somebody asking, uh, observing that the canon for Delta Green's uh, history has accumulated over all this time, and it's very detailed and dense and kind of daunting, and that with this secret history that goes so deep, and uh, they want to know uh, what do we think is the minimum necessary background information to run a Delta Green campaign or how or to put it another way how much of the canon can you dispense with before it stops being Delta for the players Green? for the players or for the for the handler for the well either player. one this is probably more for the hand from the handler's perspective right because you've got to kind of decide do I know enough of the background right to present this you know how much of the background does the handler need to know so to speak, to uh, I, I think to make uh, it a good Delta Green game. That's a, <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, yeah I, I very, very little because like what yeah. really matters is the operation. Like what's the right. op? Like that's what matters. Yeah. That's what's front and center. Yeah. If you want to do callbacks to that material, that's great. But Delta Green has always been so compartmentalized mm-hmm. that the, you know, any random group of agents going on an op to go deal with like a haunted farm, it's got some crazy sorcerer going on. Like you don't need to know all that stuff. Like you right. just need to know the op. That, that's what yeah, other, yeah. That's really and, that, and that means the, the game master doesn't need to know all that stuff either. You know, and if you if you if you put something in your campaign that you learn later later reading the handler's guide is flatly contradicted, well, okay, good. You know, use that use that contradiction and that confusion in your game. I, I sort of like the idea of a handler beginning the game by sort of presenting Delta Green as totally above board and, you know, true <laughs> blue and all American and, and, you know, just presenting that as the gameplay for a few games. And then maybe he gets born one night and decides to read some more of the man, you know, the, the handler's gotten goes, oh, shit. Um, you know, so that it's even a surprise, you know, it's even a surprise to the uh, to the handler that uh, not everything is running smoothly. It's all yeah. fucked. I mean, uh, I, yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I would sorry, that, I was just like, gonna, go ahead, Dennis. Uh, I was just going to say when John kind of brought this whole thing up, like literally when we played, you know, Convergence or whatever for the first time, it, it was kind of like you don't know that was the standard response. Like, and the questions were always like, "What is headquarters?" It doesn't matter. You know, you're on your own out <laughs> here. Good luck. Uh, and yeah. that's kind of the core of the Delta Green ethos. So I think John's exactly right. The operation is what matters. And stringing things together just kind of comes naturally over time. Um, mm-hmm. You don't need to know the entire back history, but you can certainly mine it, which is what it's actually there for. It's yeah, not yeah. There when we were when we were writing, stuff. 
when we were writing that enormous history chapter of the handler's guide, it was what we had in mind was these are ingredients that you can take or leave. Yeah. Right. Each one of these entries is something that if you want to, if you want to spin it into a campaign seed, go for it. If you want to totally ignore it, ignore it. Yeah. I think describing yeah, I think... uh, describing it as nothing but campaign seeds is probably the best description. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I, I, I think the I, canon that really ejectable. matters is your own campaign and like what's yeah. been happening in your campaign, the subplots, recurring characters, callbacks to earlier adventures you ran. Like that's what matters. That's what the stuff that's going to mean something to the players. Um, some stuff that's in a book, it's buried on page, you know, 375 or whatever is not that important, but the campaign yeah. canon is what really matters. We're not going to come yeah. to your house and slap the book out of your hands because you're playing. <laughs> Dennis yeah, I mean, and, and to, <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe. I mean, it depends where you live. If you're in the U.S., probably not. <laughs> we're safe now that's true right um it. yeah yeah i mean the the uh you know to put it another way like uh, i mean tying back to what you were saying when you first started playing you know you guys first started playing it in-house right before anything was even published um uh, about the same token i started playing delta green after like right after uh oath seven came out right when convergence first came out um and so and i you know and i i spent years playing some terrific really fun delta green games with literally nothing to go on but that one paragraph blurb you know summary at the beginning of convergence right so the, the if as long as you have the core idea in mind of this is underground right and nobody's nobody's coming to help you but you do have access to you know as many resources as the game master thinks you ought to have while still keeping it scary then you're good to go Cool. Um, okay, so the, another question about canon is uh, somebody's wondering how much of Delta Green canon comes from the writer's home games. A good a bit. bit, right? Some. I mean, some of it is just made up whole cloth because it never came up. But you know, is there stuff yeah, that, yeah. that went on in your home games that you decided uh, to just Operation of change before making it official? Yeah. Yeah, that's the that's probably the, the example I would think of is um, Operation Obsidian and the Delta Green Cannon, the Cambodia disaster and so forth um, is a sort of like revised version of a game we played together that Blair ran, um, which was sort of like, like uh -huh. the predecessor and origin of Delta Green. Um, he ran an adventure for us, so we were, you know, soldiers in Vietnam going on this horrible mission. And there wasn't meant to be like a Delta Green organization involved. Um, it was more like the the crazy colonel goes off off the off the reservation there, so to speak, and uh, and has creates problems. And you know, I, I ultimately took that and adapted it into Operation Obsidian as part of the Delta Green background. Um, but that's 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 one example. A lot of the stuff though was really more us talking about things, um, just kind of hashing it out. I guess the other exception I can think of is uh, the fate and all the stuff Dennis was doing uh, in his in his campaign. Yeah. Dennis, can you do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it was my it was a high school Call of Cthulhu campaign. It, it, they all dealt with Alzis and the fate and all that kind of stuff. That you know, we were in New York at the time and playing Call of Cthulhu, uh, Cthulhu now, and uh, they were very uh, the players were very uh, not involved with Delta Green or anything, but it was more of an occult underground New York thing, um, and that was you know it was fun. But yeah, that was all. Pretty much everything that appears in the Fate chapter happened to the players at one point or another. Um, my high school group, who we, we still play, we're playing Delta Green every weekend now for the last, I don't know, uh, six months. It's yeah. been quite fun. That's I, cool. I, That's awesome. I think my, my favorite thing that never made it into the published materials was just the shit where they're sneaking up on the cultists and their cell phone goes off. That <laughs> yeah. And it's Stephen LZ just calling up to be helpful. Yeah. Just you know, like, oh, did I yeah. call it a bad time? And he, the phone yeah. goes off and they're immediately in a horrifying firefight. Yeah, <laughs> they were not they were not happy about that. But yeah, that yeah was, no, it's quite that's fun. the most that's the most Stephen LZ thing ever, <laughs> really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you know, like on a high level, like um I remember sitting with Scott or John or or Shane on the most recent book and just coming up with ideas and floating ideas. I think John puts it best, which is, I have this idea for this weird thing. And Scott, it all began with, if I recall correctly, and I, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, with Scott handing over a giant uh, like trapper keeper filled with like, here's 70 pages of stuff. 
of cool incidents in Delta Green's history that me and John were like, holy shit, what is this? Like, this is so yeah. cool. And most of that was just cribbed from history. You know, yeah, it, but it was. Awesome. Awesome. I, I remember. I, I remember in like 1998 or so. Uh, I, I I remember finding there was a big there was a website that was just a, I think it was just an X Files fan site, but where Scott oh. had contributed <laughs> a ton of studies about a ton of stuff about majestic organization, you know, and yeah, kind of putting yeah. all that shit together. That it, that I think a lot of that eventually found its way into Delta Green. Yeah. So you're um, saying that Scott's X Files fan fiction was the foundation oh yeah. for this stuff? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but but Delta Green came first. Yeah. Yes. I was I was already trying to do some I, I had submitted some stuff to Challenge magazine that was uh for the Men in Black, where I was trying to do uh, a, a version where, you know, not the not the like the comic book that had come out. And the comic book may have been out by then. But just like trying to incorporate that mythology of, you know, the guys who either show up with information or show up and tell you not to say anything uh, into Call of Cthulhu and uh, not create them as a kind of thing that the players are a part of, but a kind of thing where the players would be their stalking horse. They'd show up and they'd direct you at a thing and you would you know, possibly investigate or whatever. And I submitted a challenge and it went, they said, no, thank you. We're not. Pulling. And then I turned around and submitted it to the oath because the oath existed. And John said, yeah, this is cute and all, but I think you should wait and see what's in issue seven that's coming out this month. And <laughs> I was, I'm so I missed the, I missed that boat, uh, and then it was just like, well, what else you got? And so, it went from there. Um, so that that that's what inspired me. That uh, Glancy, John had this great idea, and then Glancy kind of turned in this giant timeline, and I was like, oh, we can just do a timeline. Like this is awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that, that's, the, that's the thing we talked about earlier, right? Like the way to work with us is to do something better than we did. Yeah. We're yeah. like, holy shit, get that guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why, yeah. Didn't we, why didn't we write yeah. that? Yeah. I know. It's this really, makes our job really so much funny. easier. Yeah. Whenever I talk to anybody who thinks there's some like weird little, you have to know this person or anything, it's literally like, I wrote John and then Scott wrote John and then John was like, that'd be fun. <laughs> and then the stuff just kind of happened. Um, I was like, yeah, you know what? I would love to not have to write that. <laughs> <laughs> well, he exactly. was doing the layout. He was doing the layout in, a, in, in the time when layout was not at all uh -huh. fun. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of razor blades and sheets of plastic. And shit. The, yeah. the original it, oaths it, were laid out like that. Absolutely. Yeah. True. Yeah. yeah produced the Kinko's. <laughs> um so yeah there's, there's uh, another uh, another question here is uh and this i think this might might vary a bit from person to person but when writing new delta green scenarios you generally prefer to create new unnatural threats or recontextualize old lovecraftian favorites uh scott why don't you take that one well the the problem that turns up in iconoclasts is just another mask of Naruto essentially um, but, uh, but it's so that, that one, that's so distinctive that you could have easily called it anything else Yeah, and kept um, the, the essence of it. Yeah. Th that idea just came from, you know, reading some art, uh, uh, some articles on archeology span that, mm -hmm. uh, that oddly enough, Heather Hudson had directed me to the, the, mm -hmm. the articles about the stone age obsidian weapons factory in the, in the lava plains of, of Armenia that, you know, who were making weapons that turned up across the Mediterranean, you know, from the same lava flow. Um, that's where, you know, that was just, the, the most of that was launched from that article. Um, but I do have a fondness for trying to recontextualize. I have a real fondness for presenting an old problem uh, in a manner that doesn't quite, you know, doesn't quite f uh, feel the same, you know. Uh, and, and, so, and that's hard because, you know, the players have read all the books and they've read all their uh, sixth and seventh edition Call of Cthulhu and they've read the short stories. And so um, a lot of times it, uh, you know, uh, that, you know, that's a really difficult idea is to is finding a new way to use the old stuff. But I, I don't know, I get a real kick out of it. I, I get a real kick out of uh, reusing old stuff in the same way that, you know, the, the, uh, you know, John succeeded so amazingly with the uh, the Greys and the Amigo. You know, taking the old uh, Whisper in Darkness and turning that around, and Dennis with um, uh, the whole Project Rainbow of turning um, uh, the uh, the Resonator uh, from the from from beyond into you know uh, 
into the Philadelphia experiment. Um, that, I don't know, there's something really rewarding in taking the old, the old material and, and showing that there's nothing that old about it. It is still applicable right, right here and right now. It is not merely, merely period piece. Um, so I don't usually come up with, uh, I don't usually try to uh, work that hard on coming up with something new um, necessarily. Yeah. What do you think, Dennis? Uh, I, you know, I, 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 I'm an old school guy. Uh, everything Lovecraftian is not understandable by the human mind on a fundamental level. It's beyond human conception. So anything could nearly be anything. It, it is other. Um, so I'm less concerned with the actual, uh, you know, what is this? I usually rename stuff, you know, the Migo or the silent ones or, you know, um, and at the very I least, just at, to keep the help the players stay guessing. Yeah, yeah. And I often look at the threats uh, as a challenge. I'll go, um, what what can one character with a simple spell? How much damage can that person do? Mm -hmm. uh, and the answer is, you know, most scenarios I see submitted or otherwise, or here are the twenty three threats and how they interrelate. And I'm like, it's a guy with a book who right. can make anyone do one thing for five seconds. Yeah. Um, how yeah. bad could that be? And I try yeah. to make it as bad as possible. Usually it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. It works out. It's really, and monsters are like that times 10. If right. you get a really effective beastie with a nice little ability kind of in there uh, or a spell, you're set. Um, so, I, yeah. you know, I like to go real Lovecraftian, which is you see the dark young, but I don't I never call it a dark young. And its behavior doesn't make any sense, and it does oh, yeah. stuff that just scares yeah. the shit out. Yeah, never, of never, ever call it the name of from the from the manual. Yeah, right, right, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And yeah. Ch change it as much as you can. Yeah, I mean, spoil. Yeah. So, spoiler alert: if you're watching this later, uh, scrub forward a uh, uh, thirty seconds, or if you're listening live, you know, plug your ears or something. But um, I, I read a I read a Delta Green adventure called Extremophilia that I that I was really happy with when it when it was took final shape. You know, I mean, the, the 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 horror at the heart of that is not even an entire Migo. It's like a chunk of a, of of Migo stuff left behind and kind of percolating in uh you know in a in in one of those horrible uh, pollution pollution lakes in uh, Wyoming or what Montana or whatever. Um, and just the, uh, and I just sort of started having ideas of, okay, how would that fuck with people's brains? You know, how would that fuck with people's behavior? And, um, and spun it off from there, you know, less is, so yeah, I kind of agree. Like I, uh, I always have a really good time recontextualizing, but also getting very minimalist with it and looking for the implications that are going to be human um, about it. Now, what, what do you think, John, as you were working on this stuff recently yeah i don't know i mean um you know when we did the call of cthulhu d20 project uh with wizards years ago um we took a swing there at really trying to um a like avoid stats for gods and stuff because that's just ridiculous um but also in the, in the text we really tried to get across the idea that like lovecraft was making stuff up left and right um and there's no reason why you shouldn't do the same thing like you should mm -hmm. really feel free to just, what I, what I think is useful to look at is what are the themes? What are the things that resonate? Um, what are the interesting little tidbits or your gotchas or whatever that are fun? Um, you know, playing with space and time and angles and so forth. Like all that stuff is super useful, but I would just grab the the bits that stick in your head and then invent your own thing to go with it. Because I think that, yeah. you know, if these creatures are, they're pan-dimensional they're they can change shape and form and everything else like especially the, expecting them to abide by a bestiary um is is not really true to the, the concepts at all i don't think so i think in general you should just take the stuff that works for you and then transform it to make it your own i think that's really that that's that's the most lovecraftian thing you can do yeah or if you have or if you know you, you might you might you might find something creepy in a totally non cthulhu mythos source um, and then Delta Greenify it, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm reading a story by a, a novel by, uh, Stephen Graham right now called the only good Indians, which is a horror, modern, you know, a horror, horror story, horror novel about, um, uh, uh, Blackfeet Native Americans and, um, 
on and off the reservation and the the sort of the super there's a supernatural thing running through it uh that ultimately comes down to kind of um you know like the uh, spirits of animals you know and the, the the old old native american plains natives beliefs of the reality of uh the spirits in animals and in nature and that if you don't treat them right then they'll get angry with you and come after you uh and there's all kinds of ways you could easily just add some add some tweaks and make that feel uh not just spooky and spiritual but cosmic in the threat um so yeah you can and uh, i mean i mean lovecraft was you know he was kind of reacting partially to uh to sort of the the classic gothic things that he was getting bored with right you know so he was looking at vampire stories being everywhere and then rethinking them from his own lens uh, you know you remind me of another book i wanted to recommend uh actually uh killers of the flower moon by david graham Whoa. came out a couple years ago um which is an amazing nonfiction book uh about the osage tribe um who had the mineral rights to their land on the reservation um and when oil was discovered uh, they started getting murdered left and right for years and years and years. And the questions of how those rights got inherited and passed down to their survivors and then their cousins and their cousins, but always the, um, the uh, powerful white folks in the neighboring community who mysteriously ended up with all those rights somehow over the years. Um, I was always murder a... after murder after murder is a fantastic and horrifying story. Yeah, the, uh, uh, the trusts that are set up. To, you know, because these people can't possibly manage the mineral rights. So fortunately, we managed to bring in some, you know, white people to fix it for yeah. them. That's just horrifying all the yeah. way down. And, and that's an early case of federal intervention to try to address this issue and deal with it in some fashion. Uh, and it's a it's a it's a Delta Green oh. op waiting to be uh, inspired by. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, all right. So uh, somebody uh, 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 asks, wants to know. Wants us to wants us to spoil it for him. Is Stephen Alziz going to make an appearance in future materials, other than Falling Towers, of course? <laughs> what do you um, think, Dennis? I I've already written something with Stephen Alziz in it very recently, so perhaps modern day, modern maybe. day thing. Yep. Yeah. What well, tell so, anything you can tell the people about that? Uh, it's a piece of microfiction, so it'll be in the way it went down, Volume Two. Uh, mm -hmm. Alziz isn't gone. I think his last missive to Delta Green was thank you for putting away my toys or something like that. Yes. Uh, um, <laughs> but but he's, you know, who knows what he's up to. Uh, perhaps we'll explore it more. But um, he, he was never really a direct threat. He's more of a uh, more of a fun interaction if you know if you know how to party. Hell, he was he'll, the environment. He was the environment that you had to operate in. He wasn't yeah, yeah. a threat. Yeah. Yeah, in New York, he was, he was the man there. Um, but yeah, no, I, I still love the character and, and always have great fun writing for him. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so, okay, this is gonna, this is this is likely to open up a big bag of, of shouting, but uh, we had somebody who was, who was super curious about our thoughts of playing, running, writing for Delta Green in the current political environment. Uh, what would the... Uh, uh, this is this is the uh, I'm, I'm still in the 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 the, the, um, the question here. What with the fascism and terrible actions of the federal government? Parentheses. Yes, it's always been terrible, but boy, does it seem worse now. End parentheses. And yeah, you're right about that. Um, you know, it, it cur is, current is. politics. How does how does that how does that feed you? What do you think? Go ahead, John. Well, I, I think one thing is that um, what we're seeing writ large in the bureaucracy uh, with um, essentially is, is this factional warfare, right? There's, as, as it gets referred to, like the deep state, which I think of as like the rational people um, and uh, <laughs> how they're, you know, there's Apparently being- Apparently they're a secret conspiracy all along. Yeah, right, exactly. If only um, we'd known. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, it, but it, it does remind me of Delta Green and Majestic back in the day and uh, as the, the program and, and the March people and so forth now. Um, just that, that ability over time for uh, our bureaucracy to develop infighting and conflict and purge attempts and changes in leadership to try to advance agendas 
all feels very relevant to the world that we created. And I can certainly imagine like Delta Green today would be caught up in all that same machinations and who's loyal enough to who and all that kind of crap would absolutely be affecting it today in some fashion. Yeah, I mean, if nothing else, the 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 challenge of just keeping the shit secret while still yeah. stealing the money and the resources you need. Yeah, um, I mean, like when when our our president recently mentioned, like I know some very interesting things about Area Fifty One, and I'll have to think about that. You know, <laughs> like that's chilling. Yeah, I can only imagine. There's 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 you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. So some the, the director is getting with the, uh, yeah. the security guy saying, "What the fuck does he know about Area 51?" Yeah. yeah, I'm yeah so, nothing. Nothing, sir. We yeah. sent it to <laughs> right. We sent it to him in writing, so he knows nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. Like if I was in the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I'd be like, "Well, but what about the reptoid threat, Mr. President?" I just <laughs> see how see how far he goes with it. Just just um, give it just give him a bunch of nonsense to get distracted yeah. by. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The giant ants, the radioactive ants have sworn <laughs> fealty to America. So we can. Uh, no, I mean, when I look at this, you know, we, we always posited the idea of this almost um, cancerous tumor of Majestic 12 existing invisibly within the federal government. Mm -hmm. And I imagine Delta Green and the program being much like that, mm -hmm. uh, where they're just this self sealed little bag of nastiness hidden in the federal government that feed on what they need and try not to kill the host. Um, but as far as interacting with the president or anybody loyal to the president, holy hell, they would stay 10,000 billion miles away from anything to do with the White House. Oh, um, no, I've, I've, I, as I told somebody on Twitter recently, I think that, uh, you know, the, 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 pro, the program wanted to go nowhere near the White House uh, <laughs> way before this administration. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah that, that's always been the case. We yeah, there books like they just they don't brief the president. You don't brief the president. Yeah. And I, I, so so I guess getting getting beyond getting beyond the you know the the uh, our current uh, idiotic presidency just sort of more generally <laughs> the uh, the um, the environment that's kind of charged, right? You you're seeing you're seeing so many you're seeing a lot of you're seeing this kind of bifurcation of there's this slice of federal law enforcement that has way more in common with the worst parts of local law enforcement, right? Than it does with so many of the, you know, the, the, than it does with, with other branches of the federal government, you know? So you've got the, you know, I mean, the Department of Homeland Security and ICE and Border Patrol, and, you know, obviously there are, so there are decent people working there, but the worst aspects of those groups and their cultures are the ones that are that have come to the fore now, right? So, I guess as you're as you're kind of running games, as we're writing games, is it has any of is any of that really sticking with you? I uh, I haven't had a chance to really uh, inflict it on my players yet, but um, the thing I'm noticing is that for the first 16 years after 9/11, I guess first 15 years after 9-11, we uh, had a, uh, uh, a national culture that would defer to federal law enforcement, you know, because 9-11 was, they just happened and the Pentagon attack and, you know, and we're still uh, absolutely bought into this, uh, the, the war on terror. And so uh, the Patriot Act is brand new and fresh and shiny and doesn't smell yet. So um, there'd be, you know, and, and with the program coming in post 9-11, they're going to get, and they show up to do an op, they're getting a lot of, they're getting a lot of deference for being from the federal government. Uh, now, um, in the, you know, with the last three years, uh, I'm imagining, you know, uh, I would love to have, be, be able to take my players and pull the rug out from under them where they played in games before the switchover, before uh, 16 and had you know an experience of the locals defer to them but now they show up and it's either people who have been watching the you know the the gassings and the beatings out here on the in the northwest and they're like oh federales huh yeah fuck you you fascist jack booted thugs and will not cooperate or even more hilariously you get out to some you know typical Delta Green rural backwater and you find out that um, there's some constitutional sheriff out there who has deputized 60 or 70 of his beer buddies, you know, to carry their M4 carbines around in public and, you know, and suddenly the, they're out there to, you know, our agents are out there to do, I don't know, whatever, 
rural horrors are awaiting them and suddenly they're being followed around and ghosted by these guys who are looking for the agents of the deep state who are here to you know <laughs> take away our take away our but our bibles or make us wear masks or whatever the you know whatever crazy bullshit they're upset about this week um i have not had that happen but i i definitely want to especially the whole constitutional sheriff thing i cannot wait to inflict that on a bunch of agents where they show up somewhere <laughs> and a bunch of armed yahoos who've been dubiously deputized by the local you know sheriff uh are just get up in their stuff and they're not cultists sort of they're not mythos cultists <laughs> i mean you could you, know, you could go drive out you could go drive out to yakima and larp that shit yeah, right now yeah so. not not with the infection rate i'm seeing out there right now no thank <laughs> you um i was actually horrified they're all glaring look. at you with their rifles and coughing yeah uh <laughs> I, I, yeah well we've all seen the news stories about the people who went out to bend uh was it bend or uh Maybe it was over here on the uh, on the uh, Olympic Peninsula. We had some people who were run off from a town because they were allegedly, you know, they you look like Antifa, you know. And <laughs> you, you guys remember this story? I mean, it's oh, like yeah. something out of yes. a horror movie where they cut the trees down to block them. We don't oh, want you around yeah. here. That's why we trapped you. <laughs> By <cutting laughs> trees, you know? Yeah, I should point out that was the town where Twilight was set. Yes. So they yes. might have been protecting something else, let's say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The shrine of the dynasty the, of vampires, you know, in the small the town. The answer is to burn it to the ground. Yeah, the answer uh -huh. is to burn that shit to the ground. Yeah. yeah um, so <laughs> the idea of the agents going out there and be, you know, having some QAnon idiots show up to give them a hard time. Yeah, that's that's the thing that's going Oh, my happen. God. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, as, you know, as, it's a, a, as a professional writer of conspiracy theories, I'm deeply, <laughs> deeply offended by the laziness over at Q, QAnon. It's so. I just I, I I I got oh, into right. it with one of the QAnon like one of the QAnon main guys on Twitter one day about a year ago, two years ago, where I was like, "Do you think you really honestly think JFK Jr. is going to crawl out of the the Atlantic covered in seaweed and accept the VP nominate? You really think this like?" Like he died in an airplane accident. We all know this. They have, and the guy was like, "Yeah, one hundred And I'm like, "Dude, let's sit down. We can whiteboard some stuff. <laughs> I can come up with something way better than this. Yeah, that'll stand up to a couple different levels of scrutiny." Well, you know, Dennis, <laughs> this is like the Nigerian prince scams. There's this. Thing I, I know, I know. Where just... where they self-select for only the dumbest people. I mean, if they, <laughs> that's why the Nigerian prince scam is obvious. They want to get the people out. Who will only right. cooperate part right. right? You know, if they, but, they, but you know, who, who know it was who knew it was seventy percent of America. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I I guess that whole uh, IQ averages to a hundred thing means that I was <laughs> filling in for like I don't know a dozen people <laughs> my extra points or something. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's not a bell curve when they yeah. when they do oh, those statistics. Man. Yeah, it's a hockey stick. Um, <laughs> you know, the other thing that comes to mind about government stuff—it's beyond even our uh, shitastic third world crap hole borders. Um, would be uh, Germany right now, uh, where yeah. that lovely uh, Day X uh, group. Yeah, of, um, yeah I was just reading about that. And so forth, like that's a perfect example of how a conspiracy in the government could exist to pursue their aims, which they're convinced are entirely worthwhile, just like Delta Green. Uh, so yeah. check out Day yeah. X. That's an awesome situation in Germany to, uh, and by awesome, <laughs> I mean horrifying. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> white supremacists gonna rise up and kill all the like the liberal people on the right. Yeah, it's, that was an amazing story. Yeah, uh, I was blown away by the reporting there. Uh, but yeah, read that. What yeah. was that weird mind control blue ray that just washed over your face, Dennis? Because that was really freaky. No com no comments. Uh, <laughs> there, there was no blue ray. I saw nothing. What, what are you talking about? No, it's just yeah. the Donkey Kong machine going to the attract screen. Oh, <laughs> oh sure it is. <laughs> Yeah. Are you attracted now? <laughs> All right. Well, we're uh, we're 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 coming. We're at four thirty-one, which I think means contractually by union rules, if we don't get off soon, we're going to have to pay Ross for another two hours of work, no matter what we do. <laughs> so, uh, so we uh, so I think we ought to we ought to go ahead and wrap it up. Any uh, oh. any any uh, any any last thoughts? I'll I'll start uh, I'll start counterclockwise. John, you go first. 
God, I wish that over the last, uh, whatever it is now, like 24 years or something of Delta Green, uh, 27 years, whatever it is, um, I wish it had become less relevant and that there was less <laughs> to inspire it uh, oh, oh. and defeat it, but it has actually only become more and more uh, horrifyingly relevant as time oh, has gone on. On the plus side, we did dump our Nazis. Yes. You know, we killed them all. Uh, again, it was awesome. I think way prematurely. That's true. You that's know, what we, I'm, that's oh, what we, we had look, this... We had this back and forth putting the handler's guide together over, you know, we ought to just, the we feel like the Karateki is kind of thematically spent, you know, let's, yeah. let's go ahead and just let's start over. So, so see, John, we're not that relevant. There's we no have, Nazi we issue have, today. We have no Nazis. Yeah, we missed the boat. No, if yeah. we had been smarter, we would have made the Karateki a the recurring threat of the 21st century. Well, no, I, I we think just, actually, we just, we are not that smart. Honestly, I think that was the right decision. I mean, like specifically having like literally historical Nazis still alive being evil is not the right approach. Like, I think we we were right to to close the door on that um, because what we're seeing now is entirely homegrown. Right. Um, and it, it's our fault. It is a like, little bit, and, it, and it's it's in its own way, it's scarier, the fact that you've yeah. got so many people who are looking back on that shit and saying, that wasn't so bad. Yeah. Yeah, well, at least back in 1933, mom, pa, you know, Gruber, uh, you know, could you know, they have all the things that set up the rise of Nazis, and uh, you know they don't see it coming. They don't have the Time Life book series in 1930. <laughs> um, our current crop of Nazis literally looked at all the horrible shit: the the Lebensborn program, the ovens, the the sterilizing and uh, euthanizing the mentally ill, and went, "That's it. That's the thing." With the if you go boss uniform, that's the thing. Yes, that is the thing. Right there with the pile of skinny bodies and a big pile with the bulldozer. Oh, God. Yeah, that's what I'm Eastern Eastern Front enthusiasts. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. right. I hate those guys, man. Yeah. Uh, so, somebody somebody started referring to them as Veraboos, like Veaboo, <laughs> but with Wehrmacht at the front. So oh. I've been very happy with the Veraboo. Uh, yeah. Uh Dennis, even any any uh, parting thoughts? Uh, I'm just really um, every day. I feel really lucky that we have so many loyal fans who like our stuff, and um, it's really awesome to get and really heartening to get this kind of response after all these years on all these projects. Um, and I know John was a little dubious at first, but uh, uh, the Labyrinth really is just a great book. So I'm really happy it. it it got the love it deserves. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's just, it's, a, it's every day I work on this stuff. I feel really lucky. So thanks. Scott, yeah. what about you? What's on your mind? Um, I'll circle back to the original, the, 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 one of the earlier questions uh, before we got derailed by something that wasn't Delta Green. I, there are Delta Green thing, things I'm working on. I'm still working on the Nodens material uh, and the attached scenario. I hope to turn that in this year so maybe it can be a, a, a 2021 project presuming we still have a 2021 in front of us um the uh <laughs> the uh delta green century campaign that i'm working on where you play once a you know once a decade scenarios where maybe somebody can be in one or two scenarios before they're too old to be in the story more one of those is the uh, the gorgon incident that you did yeah. on rpbr yeah. and uh yes and uh the uh analog which you played in a little bit mm -hmm. and um uh, i think there's like uh maybe four that have been play tested out of six the black bag job i'm still working on those getting those together um uh, and and definitely enjoy it because it, it <laughs> although it's a campaign, it's really just a series of small adventures, you know, and uh, with maybe one problem as the theme throughout. But it's really it's really been fun to like I can do a World War Two one and then I can skip over and do a 1960s one, you know, and I, I, uh, I can hit every single beat in the Delta Green uh, universe. That's been very fun to work on. Yeah. Um, but I don't know that it's going to be ready for 2021. Uh, hopefully, I'll be, have something to turn into you for play testing by 2021. Um, but um, uh, last thoughts, you know, uh, John and Dennis nailed most of that. You know, um, it. Uh, I am definitely grateful to folks who showed up and contributed uh, their enthusiasm and their, and in some places, their work. 
Um, plenty of people have started off as fans and have uh, contributed brilliant stuff that we wish we wrote. And now it's, it's, uh, it's part of the canon. It's part of the, uh, the body of work, which is, which is very rewarding. Um, yeah, uh, that's, it, that's, <laughs> that's always good to see. Uh, almost as much fun as seeing it show up and, you know, uh, and live conspiracy websites and stuff where they just dude, just dude, go on, Amaz- go, go on Amazon Prime and flip on any UFO one, and you will hit like one out of six. Will be like, and they there's theories that they are puppets controlled by a like it's seriously <laughs> someone is someone a Gaia was reading Delta Green. They yeah. actually just cribbed a whole thing of Delta Green and put it on a Gaia ad, and I reported well, it. And they took it down. Like, it's only it's only it's only fair. I mean, I cribbed a lot of stuff from uh, Bill Cooper back in the day. You know, uh, when we were originally writing Delta Green, and it's only you know from the UFOlogy crowd. It's only fair that they turn around and steal back from us. You know, hey, hey, listen, there's a difference there. Bill Bill was saying that was real. Okay, that's just yeah. historical. That's historical fact finding. Yeah, yeah. we're we're writing fiction. Ours Different. is entirely <laughs> fiction. It's not. Yeah. Truth. <laughs> None of this is happening, citizen. Go back to sleep. Yeah, we absolutely did not turn up in a biography of Julia Child. Not at all. No, that did not happen either. <laughs> Top a, a New York Times bestseller. Yeah. 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 Way to go. Oh uh, boy. Needs, needs a better fact checker. <laughs> how about any? How about any? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll, take, I'll take any. Um, uh, I was very, I was very pleased to see that all of the Delta Green people who dogpiled that that on Amazon, <laughs> all of their, yeah, yeah. all of their reviews were taken down. <laughs> they're they're all gone now. Whoever made that but complained to the publisher and took all the one stars off. Uh, going, I think I have a screenshot hell? of the guy going. It's my favorite part is when she's a member of the secret cabal that fights Cthulhu. Yeah. one star. <laughs> I star. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, gang. Yeah, we ought to we cool. ought to, we ought to wrap it up. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, for my part, yes, I'll echo. Thank you very much to all of our fans, everybody who's watching and going to be watching. Um, it's uh, it's it's been an absolute joy to uh, to continue to to do this work and write on write write with the write in these program projects and uh, work with uh, work with these guys and Ken and Chris Gunning and uh, so many other fantastic people. So. Uh, so look for more uh, over the next few months and we'll keep churning them out. And occasionally I'll get uh, some kind of crippling emotional exhaustion or uh, anxiety attack and then things will slow down to a crawl for a while and then I'll get, you know, get past it and we'll keep going. So, so we're, uh, we're, we're, we're working on it. And uh, all, you, all you other guys, Ross, uh, can't see Ross, uh, John, Scott and Shane, the uh, password at the Canadian border is accordion. Your name is on the list. Accordion. Uh, they should just bring you through. Yeah. On it. Okay, um, to you. the hold the American yeah. holding area. Yeah. And um, we we uh, we cut we but... cut off the live feed five minutes ago, right? That's just between yeah. us. <laughs> yeah. So are you, are you, what are you calling us when we cross the border? Are we are we frostbacks or are we like uh, 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 plague dogs? I don't know. What do they call the plague, American plague, plague dogs? Plague dogs. Plague dogs. Plague dogs. <laughs> plague dogs. <laughs> well, it's reached it's reached the point where people are calling in uh, license plates now here. So I, so they're, they're, I spotted him i spotted an american 15 minutes ago at uh yeah, yeah. it's it's <laughs> it's happening um Tra- trailing yeah, my asthma that's the uh, the rcmp yeah. coming coming on on the uh, mooses no, and it's, both it's the, they and told, the mooses are wearing gas masks i told shane this i i'm the local american whisperer and about three years ago it began with wow it seems like they're having a lot of problems and now yeah. it's it reached the point of you know what fuck them <laughs> and, and and having having a canadian say anything this is a 70 year old canadian man who began with wow i really wish i could help them and three years later it's like yeah f them i don't care just uh, keep them out <laughs> all um, right we're and let's go okay we're gone thank you <laughs>